Okay, so uh, I'll be talking to you about uh, whole genome sequence-based um, multi-locus sequence typing for uh, pathogenic bacteria. So a lot of this will um, sort of build on what uh, Gary and Will have been talking about. Um, so in this, uh, this lecture, we'll go over kind of like a basic introduction to molecular typing, uh, bacterial population structure, um, and within typing and typing methods, uh, multi-locus sequence typing in particular. Uh, both the classical variant of it and uh, next generation um, versions that are uh, made possible by whole genome sequencing. Talk to you a little bit about uh, nomenclatures for uh, public health surveillance programs. And um, yeah. <coughs> so, uh, in bacterial populations, like uh, no population is completely homogeneous, even when it may seem that way initially. There are always going to be variations in uh, the distribution of uh, disease and exposure to, to risk factors. And uh, so one of the ways we can um, investigate this is uh, the concept of molecular, uh, molecular epidemiology. And that's essentially um, taking molecular approaches and using it to identify uh, pathogens. And that way we can start, look, uh, start to look Take an in-depth look at uh, their distribution in the environment and how they um, and their transmission dynamics. So the kind of general rule to uh, uh, epidemiology is you start with uh, the notion that if strains are genetically similar to one another, we assume then that they are epidemiologically linked. This isn't always the case, of course, but that's kind of our starting idea. Um, and we can use molecular subtyping to sort of take these groups and start to pick them apart and see internal structure uh, within that. Um, the uh, challenge of this is uh, like molecular subtyping methods in the lab have always been limited uh, in the amount of genetic similarity they can, uh, they can compare. And this can historically led to uh, uh, est estimation problems. So when we use uh, molecular typing for um, surveillance programs, we <clears throat> pardon me, uh, we can look at the potential sources of exposure, and we can start to look into uh, looking at building a tree and uh, understanding the lineage of these strains uh, and their relevance to, to human health. And so how we can and two major parts of that is source attribution, figuring out where a particular strain came from, and then also identifying when outbreaks have uh, have occurred. So, uh, molecular typing sort of grew out of these historical methods, uh, serotyping, biotyping, biotyping, which of course still continue, um, but they offer limited resolution uh, compared to uh, molecular subtyping. Uh, in the 90s and the early noughts, uh, there was this sort of a proliferation of molecular typing methods, uh, so PFG, MLBA, and similar vari uh, variations. And there were a lot of these. And they all sort of uh, uh, were linked by the fact that they looked at um, banding patterns on gels and uh, required a lot of human oversight to, to run and to interpret. Uh, one of the big advancements that came out of that era was one that didn't rely on gel banding patterns, and it was uh, what was called multi local sequence typing, which came out of uh, Mark Main's lab in, at Oxford. And what MLST did is it looked at a small collection of genes, uh, seven to nine, typically seven. And these genes weren't just any genes. They were particular in the fact that they were small, uh, conserved fragments of what were called housekeeping genes. So these genes provided essential functions, and we knew that they would always be in the strains. Uh, and they were uh, randomly distributed throughout the genome. So it wasn't, uh, we weren't accidentally overestimating we're underestimating diversity by targeting uh, any kind of hypervariable regions. So these uh, loci were amplified by PCR and then sequenced using Sanger sequencing. Uh, and the way that we looked at this is we looked at alleles rather than um, nucleotide variation directly. So we looked at sort of an abstraction of that, of uh, each allele at each gene. And the way that these types were assigned is they were stored in a centralized database. So this was run out of Oxford, and this allowed uh, investigators in one lab to 
unambiguously say that they had the same type or not with their strain as another lab, because they would just check against this um, Oxford database, and then so uh, and then they would know, and that, that way everybody's speaking the same language. And this was a very attractive feature for um, uh, public health people looking into typing new strains because um, no ambiguity. Um, yeah, so this became the gold standard for a lot of different organisms. Um, this small typo here, it says over 50 schemes were developed. I think it's more like 150 now. Um, and these were used very commonly in uh, both research and in um, surveillance programs. So the way MLST data is analyzed is, you, so you can look at a single gene, and if they're approximately 450 base pairs long, you could look at this as a collection of 450 <coughs> data points to be compared strain to strain. Um, and then we're looking, and MLST uses typically seven. So multiply that out and suddenly we're looking at thousands of data points that we can use to compare. However, that's not how we actually run MLST. We only compare seven because it's at the allele level. And this seems like it would be a step backwards. But even though we're sacrificing that high level of, re a little bit of the high res uh, level of resolution, it does uh, have some advantages. So, uh, of course, bacteria, when they um, reproduce, uh, they, each of the two daughter cells that come off <coughs> ideally are identical. They're clones of the parent. Um, of course, this isn't always the case. We have uh, mutations that can arise spontaneously. And so this is a vertical process. It passes from each parent to one of its um, offspring cells. And then, so this is a diver diversifying um, process. Each time this happens, we've created a new type that we can compare. So, uh, but that's not the only way that diversity can be introduced to bacterial strains. Um, the other, of course, is recombination. So this is where D um, DNA comes in from some external source, another cell of the same species, possibly. And um, this is used to replace that locus in the bacterial chromosome. So this can also introduce diversity in the same way that mutation does, in that a new allele parachutes in all of a sudden, and as a result, possibly brings in a large number of uh, single nucleotide variations between, uh, between the uh, two strains. But this can also uh, have a homogenizing effect. So if an allele has changed through uh, mutation vertically, it can also be horizontally reverted back to the original. So this. Uh, like recombination in bacterial populations complicates our interpretation of, uh, of trees. It's not strictly vertical the way, say, humans are. And so, um, and this is not just on a pairwise basis. I mean, this generalizes out to the entire uh, bacterial population structure. So there are these sort of general groupings of population structure in bacteria. So from the extreme clonal, uh, so that's uh, by and large diversity comes from vertical mutation. Uh, weakly clonal, where it, that is largely true, the same as clonal, but it, there can be sudden uh, prolif uh, proliferations of um, uh, of. Pardon me, I lost my train. Um, there could be new diversity brought in horizontally and not strictly vertically. Uh, there's the epidemic where you, you have lots of relatively rare types running around because there's lots of recombination, but suddenly one of them gets lucky uh, because it's found a host and it's adapted to that and there's a uh, proliferation of similar clones, uh, clonal expansion, and the pentamictic type, which is um, you rarely see the same sequence uh, twice because it's highly gomogenic and there's tons of diversity and sort of like everything is rare. So the epidemic population structure is what we like to see in, in pathogens. There's lots of rare genotypes circulating around. And when one of them finds a host, there's a sudden proliferation of that uh, genotype. And one way to visualize this is this sort of uh, cones model at the bottom. So you have all these strains uh, in the red dots. And when there's a sudden expansion, you have a large number of related strains that appear uh, simultaneously or seemingly sim simultaneously. Um, so this would be sort of your classic outbreak scenario. 
uh, and the problem with this is that it can make uh, interstream relationships difficult to uh, difficult to keep track of because you have these groups of seemingly clonal strains that don't have an obvious connection between them. So applying MLST to that, um, the way that these were um, sort of grouped into useful clusters was this algorithm called BURST, so based upon related sequence types. Uh, this was sort of the original uh, algorithm used, um, developed by Ed Vail. And uh, these were essentially, if, you're, if you have uh, the seven genes in an MLST scheme, each unique set of seven forms a sequence type, and these are further grouped into uh, related groups. So at four out of seven, clonal complex was the uh, terminology used for that. And then the burst algorithm went through several uh, advances. There was eBurst and then uh, Go eBurst, globally optimized uh, eBurst. So each eBurst group uh, is there's a single uh, founding sequence type and then it has sort of a ring of uh, related sequence types. So you end up with this graph structure where each sequence type is a node and then separated by edges that represent um, locus variants between the founding strain and its relatives. And this was very helpful for, uh, for interpreting MLST data and uh, uh, species that don't have this nice uh, vertical inheritance of mutations. So I sort of alluded to it a moment ago, but the MLST nomenclature um, was based on these, what were called sequence types. So these were uh, unique uh, seven gene profiles. And so in this case, um, it might be a little bit hard to see, but in this diagram, it shows uh, the clone complex sequence type and then seven genes. So in that first row, that's sequence type 21. And then there's an allele designation that's given to each, um, each allele for each gene. So each profile of seven is a sequence type. Um, some of them are single or double locus variants. Those are highlighted in gray there. So uh, that third row differs by one locus from the top row, and therefore it's a single locus variant of that top row profile. And then these sequence types are further grouped into clonal complexes. So these are uh, these are groups that share four out of the seven loci. So as you can see, each row has a unique sequence type, but they're all clonal complex 21. And the way that these alleles are named is that they've been named essentially in order of discovery. Because I mentioned earlier, there's that centralized database. So different researchers would uh, investigate their strains and find a new allele, and they would submit the database. So, and then that would just be appended to the list. And, uh, and the uh, allele number would increment by one. So when you're typing your strain you, in the lab, you've developed uh, You've sequenced this, these, each of these seven genes, you would compare against the database, and then look up the uh, relevant uh, names for it. Uh, to make these databases work, though, they were carefully curated by humans, and, and still are. Um, these are something that's still in active use. So even though MLST was great in the late 90s and early 2000s, and right up until recently, um, there are problems that have been manifesting themselves as we get, get better at uh, at uh, molecular typing. Uh, foremost is that it does only use seven genes out of thousands in a uh, strain. And so you're only really looking at a, a very small fraction of the, uh, of the genome. So there's limited information in that. And strains that are otherwise can be quite different might show the same uh, ST. And the reverse, uh, reverse can be true as well by chance. So the obvious solution then is to scale the MLST concept up to the entire genome, because we have whole genome sequence now. It's fast and relatively cheap. So uh, you can take this, gene, this seven gene MLST concept and scale up to hundreds or thousands of genes. Um, and as uh, people all over the world are sequencing more and more and submitting these, um, their data to online repositories, we have uh, ever greater diversity to look at in, uh, in which to design our scheme. So, but of course it's not that easy. Otherwise we would not be talking here about it. So the problem with scaling that up is uh, you run into this concept of the pan genome, which uh, Will talked about 
So the pen genome is the totality of um, all genes available to a bacterial species. Uh, no two, or not no two, but there's no guarantee that any two strains within a species will share exactly all the same genes. There are, there's a, so the pen genome is broken into two segments. There's the core genes, which are shared by all strains. They're definitional to the species. So these are sort of a, an expansion of that housekeeping gene concept that I mentioned earlier. So these are essential. And then there's also a complement of genes uh, called the accessory genes or the accessory genome. And these are often adaptive and no two particular strains are guaranteed to share um, accessory genes. They might, they might not. So when you're designing a whole genome MLST scheme, you start to um, run into problems that are related to that. So when you're comparing um, two strains and you're using draft data because it's relatively rare that people uh, complete their bacterial genomes, you usually have to draft state. So you have several large contig uh, contiguous pieces of uh, sequence data contexts with gaps between. And uh, so when you're comparing strains, like a large portion of the strains will be missing at least some genes out of your scheme. Uh, and then, so you end up with this problem because of the accessory genome. You don't know whether you're missing those genes because you lost it in the sequencing step and it's biologically there, or it's not biologically there. This could be difficult to extract. Um, and so that these incomplete things, is when you, so let's say you've targeted some gene and it's spanning the gap between contigs, that you lose it. You might get partial or you might be missing the gene entirely. If it's partial, you might know it's there, but you also don't know um, the, uh, the identity of it, what the exact sequence, which is what the scheme is uh, based on. So another problem with accessory genes is they can often show significant variation in length and in sequence. Um, highly variable genes can be problematic to a whole genome uh, scheme because it, it can mess with homology searches. So, <clears throat> and when they're highly variable, you, it can be difficult to tell if you're even talking about the same gene because of the issue of paralogs in your, in your genome. You might, through gene duplication events, you might have multiple similar um, variations of a gene, and then suddenly when you're trying to assign an unambiguous type, you don't know which one you're looking at. So the paralog issue can be particularly um, difficult to work with, especially once you've scaled up to thousands of genes and you have a lot of comparisons between things that may or may not be the same. It's hard to assign um, a true sequence type, and a lot of them might be untypable. Is the classic MLST system required that you have full data at all seven genes. So if you're scaling that concept up to thousands of genes, suddenly you've got this problem where you don't know what you have, essentially. And this missing data issue becomes uh, problematic as you add more uh, genomes, because on a sufficiently large data set, every locus will be missing at least some of the time. And a lot of them tend to come from a small number of genomes. So it can be difficult to identify which ones were the bad ones if you don't know what's supposed to be there to, um, to begin with due to the accessory content issue. So what ends up being sort of problematic to the idea of whole genome MLST is that missing data is ultimately inevitable. And you, if you don't have a consistent definition of what genes are supposed to be there, you don't know when they're missing due to technical problems or to biological problems. And ultimately, you're going to have to be willing to make sacrifices in order to divine uh, a scheme that's robust and can be used for surveillance. So that's where this concept of uh, core genome MLST, so distinct from whole genome, core genome MLST. So this is sort of a halfway step between the idea of the classical MLST, we're looking at seven highly conserved genes, and whole genome taking everything that's available. Because uh, it's just there's too much sequencing there are too many genes, and it rules out things like manual curation that worked for uh, classical MLST. So with core genome LST, we target only the core genes. So these are genes that we know to be present in every member of the species. And that way, when we see an absence, we know that it was due to a technical error and not due to biological absence. This makes the assignment of uh, CGMLST types a little more tractable than uh, whole genome MLST. Uh, 
And although core genes, just because they're core genes, doesn't make them automatically good, there will still be ones that um, don't play nicely with your with uh, your scheme if they uh, are potential if they have paralogs. It uh, that can cause problems, or if there's large degree of uh, length variation. But if you're very conservative with your um, definition of a CGMLST scheme, then you can end up with the same, a lot of the same advantages of uh, classical MLST, in that you will always know the genes are there, and you can assign types, and uh, there's no ambiguity. So in designing the scheme, the main steps uh, fall into sort of these three categories, identifying all potential target loci, and then from that, pairing it down to, or separating them out into core and accessory uh, genes. And, uh, and coming up with a nice consistent set and extracting those core genes. You identify loci that are in all strains. Of course, we can't go too crazy. If we're looking for 100% and we have thousands of strains of varying sequence data, we are going to miss some loci, but you should be as stringent as possible. So um, our definitions of core genome that use something very relaxed, like you know, it's got to be present in 80% of the strains, but that won't work here. Like, so if you're looking for genes that are present in 99.9%, you can come, with, uh, come up with a very conservative set that still gives you lots of um, typing resolution, but minimizes your troubles down the road. And you have to do some, so if you have this, you, you've designed, or you've been given a core genome uh, MLST scheme, you have to do sort of some sanity checks. Like first, is, and probably biggest, is just do these make sense at all? Does it make sense given uh, the literature? If your code genome is too big, you've probably included uh, accessory genes. If it's too small, you probably haven't captured uh, um, enough diversity, and uh, and, you, and you're missing core genes. Uh, so as long as you're capturing as much diversity as you can and filtering up poor quality genomes, you should end up with a relatively good definition of uh, core genome in your species. Another common pitfall that I've encountered with uh, other designs is that they'll sometimes attempt to merge species, um, and then this uh, uh, complicating results because there are different species for a reason, and they don't share. They might share much of the core genome because they're fall into the same genus, but um, this also can end up breaking a scheme. So once you've done. Uh, design the scheme, you have to go through and sort of polish things up and make sure it's as good as it can possibly be before you unleash it upon the world. Uh, so removing like uh, variable genes, as I mentioned, parallelous genes, um, and in looking at the data and making sure that everything makes sense and there aren't any uh, issues that got past the initial quality filtering. So, I've been talking about this MLST approach, and Gary earlier was talking about uh, SNP typing for uh, bacteria, or SNIV typing. Um, so, and that's the approach of uh, taking an alignment and basically seeing which SNPs are in uh, each strain, so single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms. So with SNPs, you end up with the uh, highest possible discriminatory power because you're comparing everything that it has to offer. But if you approach that naively, you end up um, susceptible to the effects of horizontal transfer, the combination that issue that I mentioned earlier. So a new gene might come in, and instead of a single vertically inherited mutation or a small number, you can end up with a large number of, um, of uh, these issues. Snivel, which we attempted in the preceding lab, does work around this by filtering out um, highly variable regions. MLST, however, is easier um, if you're trying to assign standard names and standard nomenclatures. Uh, it's resistant to the issue of recombination because if a gene is recombinant, it will change a single allele, but it won't um, distort that by showing all the different uh, SNPs that have been introduced by that. So you've sacrificed some discriminatory power essentially by using LST in exchange for um, a robust nomenclature. And nomenclature is important because that. Uh, because of what I mentioned earlier, the ability to unambiguously discuss the same strain between labs in a way that's reproducible. We can, uh, we can know that a lab in Canada and a lab in Denmark is talking about the same thing if they have the same names. And for public health, of course, this is of uh, particular interest.
So uh, for core genome MLSTO, um, because there is, even though it's uh, reduced uh, discriminatory, discriminatory power relative to SNP typing, it is um, still very high resolution and it's often useful to cluster it back slightly. So what I mean by that is, uh, so this graph that I've generated here shows the similarity of different clustering thresholds to their neighbors. Essentially what that means is if you try to go too stringent with a CGMOST scheme, so let's say you have a 700 gene scheme and we're going to compare two strains at 700 genes, um, things are unstable and clusters can rapidly change um, in this very short term. Uh, so by picking uh, a clustering threshold that's a little bit back from that, you can come up with a useful name for your strain that remains stable over time and uh, time and space. So this particular example was drawn from uh, Cloud Vector Juni. Um, so we had determined that comparing below uh, 45 differences was unstable and uh, Campy is a particularly um, difficult species to work with in regards to that there is a lot of recombination. So sort of like the overall workflow of a CGMOST analysis is beginning with um, whole genome data and then there's sort of a, a branch because you can either do assembly free and work directly off the reads and that's what something like Mentalist um, or SRSD2 could do. Otherwise you can go to assemblies, assemble your genome into, um, well, into assemblies. <laughs> and then uh, assign types using programs like Chewbacca, which came out of uh, University of Lisbon, or just the simply named MLST. And then uh, finally, cluster it and visualize it using programs like Phylovis or like GrapeTree. And I'll be talking about GrapeTree in uh, my upcoming lab. So the, the sort of data that you'd want to have to do an analysis like this would be a collection of multi-fasta files for containing your allele definitions, a list of sequence types that you can um, use to assign uh, give to strains given their types, and then of course some of the software I just talked about. There are other options. There's uh, Seeksphere from Rhythm or Bionumerics from Applied Maths. They each have their own MLST systems um, and their own MLST schemes. However, these uh, can be quite expensive, expensive as I'm sure you will know. There's also the BigsDB genome comparator, which was by the same authors as the original MLST, but this can be difficult to set up in your own lab. It's, uh, it's a bit of a fussy program. We've been using uh, Chewbacca. So once you've run it, you have uh, MLST type or CGMLST types assigned, and then you can visualize uh, that through something like GrapeTree or Phylovis. Uh, it can be a minimum spanning tree. So these are these eburst groups that talk, talked about earlier. And uh, you can annotate these with metadata because I think Will mentioned earlier that sequence on its own is meaningless. You have to connect it to uh, some form of metadata to draw any um, interpretations. So just to conclude, the MLST approach, also known as gene by gene, um, <laughs> is one of two primary methods. Uh, it can be contrasted with SNP typing. It's particularly useful in, if you know your organism is highly recombinogenic. Um, it can be used in clonal organisms, but that's where SNP typing's high resolution is, uh, is most appropriate. And uh, in real life, uh, a hybrid approach will be required, of course. Uh, and with that, I guess we're out of break. Mm -hmm.